Welcome to our YouTube channel where wisdom meets inspiration. In this channel, we share valuable insights to help you become the best version of yourself. Our content is designed to uplift your spirit and enrich your life. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to stay connected with this incredible journey. Click the subscribe button below. Om Asato Ma Sadgamaya Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityur Ma Amritam Gamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Lead us from the unreal to the real Lead us from darkness unto light Lead us from death to immortality Om Peace Peace, peace. Dwell on how do we tackle problems from this perspective of I am awareness itself or the world is nothing but arising in awareness. First, let's note, according to Krishna, according to the Yoga Vashishta, according to every spiritual text, whether Vedantic or non-Vedantic, even when you are enlightened, you are spiritually perfect. Or if, if there are religious traditions which do not use the language of enlightenment, and they use the language of becoming a saint. Even when you are a saint. Or troubles, your troubles will not cease. That's interesting. Not perturbed by sorrows means first of all, aha, so sorrows will keep coming when I am enlightened? Yes, they will. Karma, our past karma, will keep giving results. As long as there is a body, we will have experiences. So whether you are a saint or a bodhisattva or a jivan mukta, whatever term you use, sthita pragya, in the, the one of stabilized wisdom, muni, the silent one, enlightened one, whatever it is, externally problems will come. Old age will come, disease will come, death will come, financial instability, political, social problems, um, difficult people, all of these will come in our lives but we must think about the nature of this sorrow and here the Buddha can help us he says what spirituality can do and what it cannot do it's very clear make a, we must be very clear and make a distinction of the two and he gives the example of being hit by two arrows the man who was hit by two arrows the first arrow is what the world throws at us and that is old age, disease, death, difficult people, all kinds of things. Heat, cold. And the second arrow is the re our reaction to it. And the Buddha says, most of our suffering is our reaction to, that, to the first arrow. First arrow is not all of our suffering. It's only a fraction of our suffering. And this I saw, I, uh, very interestingly, many, many years ago, there was a conference on pain. Um, doctor's conference. So there, mo most of the sessions were about this pill or that pill and this kind of uh, uh, medicine, pain relieving. But there was one session on talk therapies, on uh, counseling for pain and chronic pain. So many people suffer from some kind of ache, some kind of pain, some kind of recurrent or continuous pain. And it has to be managed. Often it cannot be totally overcome. It has to be managed. And there, the, the doctor who was presenting it, uh, he drew these three circles. He said, the smallest circle inside is the actual physical pain which we feel. And he says, that's just 20% of our suffering. And th that was the figure he gave. The larger circle outside is our reaction to that pain. Uh, uh, that, uh, oh, it's going to hurt. Oh, this is so awful. Why must I suffer this? Oh, here we go again. Uh -huh. So that, that kind of thing. And the largest circle is the social problems, the you know, society, career, career, all the problems set up by my own internal suffering, whatever the suffering is. So he says 80% of our suffering is that, and the actual physical pain you feel at that particular moment is 20% only. And then he said, this is the hidden scandal of all our <laughs> medicine, is that all the medicines that we give for relieving pain are meant for that 20%. There also it doesn't work too well. And it creates, what is guaranteed is to create side effects. Side effects. 
So the pills that we will give to the patients who complain of pain, that will address the actual physical pain, the 20% of it, and it's not guaranteed to cure that. And it will create side effects also. Whereas the others, they will continue. Even when there's a even little bit of physical pain, we get used to it, so we keep reacting that way. So 80% of our pain is not addressed directly by the medicine. And that can be addressed by psychological methods. That's what the doctor said. And it's true. Buddha says most of our pain is our reaction to the world, reaction to our physical pain, reaction to other people, reaction to things happening in the world, in our lives. And that's our real suffering. And he says spirituality can address that one, that second one, not the first one. So your armor, the armor of Brahman works against the second, our reaction. Dukkha will keep coming. The problems of the world will keep coming. But you can armor yourself. Eh? Brahma Kavacha Sukhi. You can be happy in the armor of Brahman. They'll bounce off you. <laughs> the arrows thrown by the world. A quick analysis of pain from a Vedantic perspective. And then it will help us to deal with it. Of pain, of suffering. Physical suffering, emotional suffering, whatever. Anxiety, fear, whatever. All of that. Keep in mind the two arrows. First one will not cease, but the second one is the important one and we can deal with it and we should be ready to deal with it. So the three levels of analysis which we will do are three kinds of analysis. Um, one is the cause of pain. Let's look at it from a Vedantic perspective, the cause of pain. The second one is the very nature of pain. What is it? What's it made of? What's it made of? Second one. Third is from the perspective of spiritual practice and all very quickly. The Sanskrit terms for these are uh, karana drishti, a perspective from, the, from ca causality, what causes pain. Vastu drishti, a perspective from the, uh, of, of reality, what's it really, pain. And sadhana drishti, a perspective from, the, uh, from practice. Okay. Karana drishti, a very traditional way of looking at suffering in, um, in Vedanta, in Indian spirituality, is it's caused by three things. Adi Daivika, Adi Bhautika, Adhyatmika. So, three kinds of causes for all our troubles. One is natural causes. So, that's called Adi Daivika. Uh, causes, suffering caused by weather or earthquake. We had earthquake? Mm -hmm. Not much. Very little compared to so people from California would have rolled their eyes at the way people here, here <laughs> reacted. It's, it was a baby earthquake. <laughs> and the way we reacted here, uh, somebody sent me uh, a circular from NYU saying that if you're feeling scared, 24-7 our counseling center is open. <laughs> if you feel nervous about it, we can talk to you about it. <laughs> so that is natural causes. And then uh, Adi Bhotika from other living beings. The traditional example is... Um, Snakes and tigers. We don't face too many snakes and tigers in Manhattan. But let's say, um, um, what? Rats. Yes. <laughs> Rats. <laughs> Just the day for yesterday, there was a news item. How to deal with the rats of New York City without brutality. <laughs> you have to be kind and yet to take care of the, <laughs> the pests. So, rats. Or other human beings. Yeah. So the difficult neighbor, or the boss, uh, uh, the difficult roommate, whoever it is, uh, people in the family. Uh, so all kinds of problems you have to deal with. You can't escape. Uh, if you, but you can escape. You be a monk. Yes, you can be a monk. But in the monastery, there are tough seniors to deal with. They're troublesome. <laughs> uh, you know, co-monks, other monks of your uh, seniority to deal with. So. The, it's, it's not, you cannot escape from other beings. And then finally, adhyatmika, from one's own body-mind. So illnesses, physical, mental, all of this. So three kinds of causes. Then, and all of these, why are they coming to us, particularly me? Because of my past karma. So this is one way of understanding the causality of sorrow. Deeper. Second level of understanding causality of sorrow. Is, it's called um, dukkhatmika vritti. All sorrow to be sorrow has to enter our minds. It's only when we take cognizance of it 
You know, the classic story of the man who came home happily. His son had died, but he didn't know about it. He was happy until he knew about it. Then he fainted from grief. So that, see, once it enters our mind, without entering our mind, no sorrow is sorrow. Even physical sorrow, if you don't feel it. That's the way why sedatives are given, uh, you know, anesthetics are given. You don't feel it. Then it's not a sorrow. So when it enters our mind, that is the cause of sorrow. Vritti means movement of the mind. Dukkhatmika vritti means movement of the mind in the form of sorrow. It's awful. It hurts. Ouch! That is sorrow. All sorrow has to come there finally. And the, what we take away from it is, in that case, in that case, a change in the mind can change the way we experience life. That beautiful saying, I've quoted it so many times. Milton. The mind in its own place can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. Uh, the, our minds, right now, it, our circumstances might be very difficult, but there are so many inspiring stories of people who have risen from very difficult circumstances because their minds were focused on the positive. So in the mind, the suffering was not there. Or a, um, a hell of heaven. We have heard so many stories of you know, children coming from privileged backgrounds and families and turning their lives upside down, uh, maybe addictions or whatever it is, uh, and ruining all sorts of, the you know, born with the, what, silver spoon in the mouth and then, uh, so can turn a heaven into hell, the mind in its own place. So dukkhatmika vritti, the, what are we entertaining in our minds? And here a little bit of uh, input from modern from yoga and from modern positive psychology, Mihai Chikzen Mihai in his book Flow, he says one crucial thing to understand about the mind is its very limited cognitive bandwidth. We can, to put it very simply, we can attend to only one thing at a time. And that's great because we have a choice over the next thing we can attend to. What am I going to think about? I can choose. And the moment you choose what you are going to think about, you will immediately determine how you will feel. Shall I think about the positive, the good, the pleasant, the interesting, the uh, edifying, the uh, sublimating, the sublime? Or will I think about the awful, the threatening, the horrible? Deal with it, but keep your mind on the good. I read this, uh, Winifred Gallagher, she's, she writes in this book, Wrapped, that um, about a cancer patient whose life was you know, turned upside down because of the chemotherapy and the anxiety and the bills and all of that and until she said, I can't take it anymore. I can't live in this way. So I'll just concentrate on the good part of my life. She was a writer. So focus on that. And then she says, when I made a determined effort to focus on the positive and the good in my life, after some time when it, I could do it, my life after cancer was actually better than my pre-cancer life. Because, true, because she had taken charge of the mind. What enters the mind? I will not allow my mind to dwell on these things. And it takes effort. Why? Because the mind has a default setting. If, you don't, if, we, if we do not attend to the mind, it will immediately go to what seems threatening, what seems worrying, what seems unpleasant, and stay there and chew on that and make our lives hellish. So, Dukkhatmika Vritti. I often quote a monk who said, very beautifully put it, we think um, my mind is troubled because of samsara. But the fact is, samsara is because my mind is troubled. I, in Hindi, it's even more beautiful. He says, Hum sochte hai, uh, asha, samsar ke chalte man ashant hai. Lekin asli baat hai ki ashanti ke liye samsar hai. Then he adds, Shant man mein bhala samsar kaun dekha hai? Uh, who has ever seen samsara in a, in a serene mind? When your mind is like a full moon, uh, full of dewdrops, where is samsara there? The mind in its own place can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven and use the crucial insight into the mind that it has limited bandwidth and we have a choice of what to put there because I can't control my mind that's the problem alright but we can control our mind the next moment 
Right now I can decide, take a decision, I shall think of my mantra. And yes, I am thinking of my mantra. Yes, next moment my mind might wander. I again have, luckily, that power of choice is unlimited. Every moment we have a new decision to make. We don't think about it. That's why by default our mind goes to habitual patterns of thinking and feeling. But every moment we have the freedom. And we exercise that freedom every moment. Why we feel defeated by the mind is, I am going to think about God. I might think about one second, but the rest of the next one hour I, I can't think about God. Well, make the decision for second to second. The moment you think the mind is troublesome, decide what you will allow the mind to dwell on and what you will not. The next moment. That all of us can do. All the time. We have that freedom. The tremendous subjective freedom we have internally. So that's the second um, takeaway from the second level of causality of sorrow. Uh, don't forget the big picture. The, we are investigating what causes sorrow. The second level is uh, mind. Dukkhatmika vritti. The, the sorrow, the mind takes the form of sorrow. Deeper analysis. So right now notice, we have moved from the first arrow to the second arrow. The external cause, natural causes, sorrow given by other beings and sorrow given my own body. That's first arrow in the Buddha's terminology. But the moment I see my mind dwelling on it, making a hell out of heaven, that's the second arrow already. We have to deal with it at that level. And then the third, even deeper analysis of the causality of sorrow is abhimana, dukkha abhimana. It is my sorrow. As long as I am identified by, with the uh, ego, which I be automatically by default are I, this person right here, but the ego is a part of the mind. And the mind dwells on so many things, including miserable things also. And the ego will automatically be associated with what, whatever. There's a movement of anger in the mind. And what's our natural reaction? I am mad at you. We don't say, I, the pure consciousness, illuminate a movement of anger in the mind. No. It's, I am mad at you. I am unhappy. I am upset. Uh, I am uh, um, uh, you know, angry or whatever it is. So identifying with it. It's mine. It's mine. The way they put it in Vedanta is very sublime. He says, how many, how many minds are you going to polish and refine? What are these minds like? This is like a beam of light in the early morning. Imagine a Himalayan cottage and the monk meditating. The first beam of sunlight comes to the little window. And in that beam of light, Thousands, Brownian movement, thousands of little particles of dust are floating around. Tiny, you can see the movement. All these thoughts and feelings and in all the minds are like the little particles of dust floating along in that shining ray of light. What is that shining ray of life? Light, awareness, consciousness, jidakaram, you. How many of those pieces of dust are you going to polish, turn from hell into heaven? Not necessary. Just disown them. Just dissociate from them. Let them come. Let them stay. Let them float around. Let them disappear. I'm fine. They will go away. That's the very nature of the mind. The worst of feelings and the best of feelings, whatever has arisen, will subside. Whatever. Even the worst of feelings. Even deep depression. The most abiding, sinking feeling one might have. When you fall asleep, it disappears. So every movement of the mind will subside. It's not you. If it was an integral part of us, we would come and go with those feelings. We don't come and go. The holiest of feelings, the most vilest of thoughts, they come and go. We don't come and go with them. We illumine them. We give them existence and light while they are around. And then they disappear back. Fine. You say calmly, you're welcome to come, welcome to stay. And when you go, goodbye. Farewell. Hmm. I am the ever shining light. So these are the three levels of causality. The third, the deepest level is this. What Vedanta is talking about is here that I am the witness of these thoughts. I, they are not me, nor are they mine. They are no part of me, nor even are they my thoughts. They are in this mind. Even just as the world is not mine, the body is not mine, the mind is also not mine. I am the witness of this mind. As I am the witness of all minds. The consciousness in all bodies and minds illumines those my bodies and minds. I am that one consciousness in all beings. 
So this is the third level of causality. Then the next is uh, um, analysis of what is sorrow. So all, this is all analysis of pain from a Vedantic perspective. Vastu drishti, what is sorrow itself? Again, three ways of looking at it. One way is the highest non-dual way, which is talked about here. Chidakaram idam sarvam. What is sorrow? The feeling of sorrow which had unpleasantness. It is Brahman itself. Brahman alone. That, that one pure consciousness, existence consciousness, please, it is being experienced right now as that miserable feeling. It's really difficult to wrap our minds around. But it's fact. Without pure consciousness, it wouldn't exist. Did we not just say flower? Flower as seeing. The seeing as nothing other than pure consciousness. Then what is that flower which you saw? Pure consciousness. What is that suffering which we are feeling right now? The flash of pain and flash of irritation. Pure consciousness. Brahman itself. If you say that's too much. I can't see the miserable and the horrible as Brahman itself. All right. Um, take it a step down. Um, it is, Bra first one is Brahma Swarupa. The second one is Brahma Vivarta. It's an appearance of Brahman. Now we can bring in the dream example. We can bring in the film example. Just like a nightmare. Why is a nightmare not so horrible? It's horrible while it lasts. But when we wake up and recognize it to be a nightmare, why isn't it horrible anymore? Terrible things happened there. It's no, it's no longer a big deal. Because it was nothing other than a dream, we realize. It was an appearance in me. It really didn't happen to me. Similarly, whatever appears in this limitless light of pure consciousness, it's an appearance. It's like a movie. It's like a dream. Like the Buddha said, like bubbles in a fast flowing stream, like phantoms in the dark, like a flash of lightning, is verily everything in this world. Impermanent, impermanent, all is impermanent. Transient, momentary, momentary, all is momentary. Empty, empty, all is empty. And therefore, uh, these are all appearances of Brahman. Like a dream. You see the difference between saying, it is Brahman alone. And we are saying that it's an appearance in Brahman. A kind of shade of duality is, in, is introduced here. If that's also not possible, I can't dismiss this world as a dream. Then the third level of uh, what is it? Sorrow. Uh, prakriti Parinama. It's a transformation of material nature. A transformation of material nature. According to Sankhya, Prakriti, nature, is made of three gunas. Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. And Rajas, the the guna, the constituent of dynamism and activism uh, and uh, activity, energy, it also causes pain, pleasure and pain. Sattva actually is the source of joy and rajas is the source of pain. So suffering is caused by the rajasic element in the material nature present in the mind. I am the witness thereof. I am the witness thereof. These are three ways of regarding the nature of pain. But they are graded. The highest, what is pain? Brahma Swarupa, it is Brahman alone. I rejoice. There are examples. The, the Vivekananda gives the example of the cobra which bit the monk. I think it was Pavari Bhava. Cobra which bit the monk and when he came to his senses again, people asked him what had happened he said it was the messenger from the beloved. See, he's talking the same in the language of devotion. It's n he didn't say it was a dream. No, it was real. But it's a messenger from the beloved. My Lord alone came as the cobra and bit me. <laughs> or uh, because my Lord sent that cobra to bite me. It's perfectly all right. Um, it's, it's a source of delight for me. From the devotional angle. Um, that is called Brahma Swarupa. Everything in this world is Brahman. Then the second level is Brahma Vivarta, an appearance, a dream in, in, in pure consciousness. Just like a flower is arising in pure awareness, a flash of pain is arising in pure awareness. When we say a flash of pain is arising in pure awareness, it's a most accurate description of pain. That's what pain is. In any kind of experience, it's that. It's an arising in pure awareness. And I am that pure awareness. And then third level is... If we cannot deal with a dream uh, uh, in a paradigm, all right, it's real, it's out there, but it's not me, not mine. I am a witness of that. Notice, these are three philosophical paradigms. The, this 
this one, that I am a witness of the material nature, physical body, mind moving like this, this is all material nature, I am the witness of that, including pain and unpleasantness, I am the witness of that, and I am always free of it, as the witness of it. This is Sankhya Drishti. This is from the perspective of Sankhya. When we say, it's a dream in pure consciousness, this is the perspective of the jnani, the one who realizes I am Brahman. When you say, even it's not even a dream, it is Brahman alone. There's no division between me, the pure consciousness, and the appearance of pain. That is also pure consciousness. I alone appear in that way to myself. That is a vijjanis, what Sri Ramakrishna used to call a vijjanis drishti. Everything in this world is yeah, filled full with Brahman. What is pain? It is filled full with Brahman. Nice to say, Swami, on a Sunday lecture, but when, <laughs> when you actually feel the pinch of pain, try any of one of these approaches. Finally, um, sadhan drishti, from the perspective of practice, how are we to practice this? There are multiple practices. One is from the perspective of Vedanta, Jnana, Advaita with non-dualism, which we are talking about. Here there is a term called Pragya Aparadha, um, an offense against spiritual wisdom. What it means is this, an offense against spiritual wisdom. To even complain about pain, it's an offense. <laughs> if you say, I am Brahman, I am pure consciousness, and then you say next, this hurts, this is awful, it's an offense. You are, you are offending Vedanta. You're offending the highest wisdom of the Upanishads. If we honestly say, I am pure consciousness, we also have to say, it's fine. Swami Turiyananda, in his uh, one reminiscence about Swami Turiyananda, he was a great Vedantin, non-dualist, in his old age in, in Banaras, where he passed away finally, he had many kinds of illnesses in the body and a lot of suffering. Somebody obviously asked him about it and he said, why do you see the storms on the surface? Bairet jala, the, the burning, the, uh, the problems on the surface. Why do you see that? Why do you not see inside it is all ice? He could have said all dewdrops, but he said all ice. Bhitore shab barof. Barof gets It's all, all ice inside. There is no suffering within. I have seen um, Swami Bhuteshanandaji, the 12th president of our order. He was nine, nearly 97, 98 years old. And obviously not keeping well. So often when we would go to offer our pranams to him, he was the president of the whole order. I was a newcomer, a brahmachari. The senior monks would often ask about his welfare. Swami, how is the body today? In Bengali, as Sharir come on. How is the body today? And he would scold us for it. He would say, why do you people keep talking about the body? <laughs> why do you talk so much about the body? In Bengali, he would say, Atosh tumra ato shorir shorir karo kena. <laughs> why do you talk so much about the body? So, the, uh, the one thing is to say that is this is pragya aparad. It's an offense against Vedanta. Or if you are a devotee, I love the Lord my God. I have surrendered. Everything is, in Sri Ramakrishna used to say, Rame Richa. It's the will of Rama. It's the will of God. Everything is the will of God. If it is truly, honestly, if you are saying it so much, if you are practicing it so much, again you cannot complain. It's an offense against God to complain. That's one way. Vedantic way. The other way would be the devotee's way. The devotee's way, the one who loves God. Then both sukha and dukkha, happiness and unhappiness, are the grace of God. Is Ishwara Anugraha. By the grace of God, things go well, things go badly. All of them tend to my spiritual edification, my spiritual evolution. And hence, again, I deal with pain in this way. By the Lord's will, it has come in this way. Monks, I mean the verses, there are later there are verses in this chapter itself, how this one who is like a full moon, how this one behaves and strangely. Sometimes enlightened people are very strange. <laughs> the, I was reminded of one, they would, they put it, one of the verses says, he puts himself into trouble to test. <laughs> that reminded me of a monk, I didn't see him but I heard about him. He was in our ashram in Haridwar. Um, now, it's a custom for visitors and devotees to give a little bit of money as a present to the monk. It's called pranami. 
But people were cautioned against giving any money to this monk. What he would do is the moment he got any money, he could be just going to the meditation room or just taking a walk. Anybody comes and bows down reverentially and hands over a little bit of money, he will walk straight to the railway station. Immediately, starts walking. No morning, afternoon, night, whatever it is. Goes and they know in the railway counter. He'll thrust that money into the ticket. There used to be ticket counters before all this online stuff came. And they knew this monk. So it's in Haridwar. They know all kinds of weird monks. So they... Whatever ticket, the furthest distance you can go on that money, that ticket would be advanced to him immediately. And he would wait for the train and get on the train. It would take him, he doesn't know where. And then once the train, he gets down from the train, he will make his way back to the ashram, begging for his food and staying under a tree. That was his practice. So people were alarmed and they were, don't give him any money. <laughs> because we might not see him for months or years. Who knows, he'll be gone. <laughs> So, and then he would test himself by coming back and entirely depending on God for a place to stay and food to eat. And so, full moon, huh? <laughs> like a full moon. That's where the term loony came from, I think. <laughs> then the third practice is the yogi's practice. Uh, Sadhan drishti. That you, you shut it down, the pain. The physical pain, the anxiety, whatever comes up in the mind as pain, because yoga is chitta vritti nirodha, shutting down the movements of the mind. The capacity, that requires a lot of training in meditation. The capacity to shut it down, to flip a switch as, as it were. In the Gita also, uh, Sri Krishna says, like a tortoise withdraws its limbs. You should be, the yogi should have that much command over the senses to be able to withdraw from the source of pain. Notice the Vedantin actually experiences the pain and sees it as the radiance of pure consciousness or whatever it is. The bhakta, devotee, lover of God actually experiences the pain and sees it as the grace of God. The yogi does not experience the pain. It's like an anesthesia, he can shut it off and plunge into deep meditation. Like um, Shivananda, when that asthma was there, he was able to turn his, absorb his mind entirely within so that he didn't feel it. And strangely enough, the body also relaxed. When the conscious uh, experience of the body, when you withdraw from it, the body also relaxes. Then the karmi, karma yogi, that is a unique perspective on sadhana of pain, the practice. The selflessness is of such a high order that one's own troubles and pains do not matter. A great selflessness comes over us we see the divinity in all beings and our whole life is spent in the service as a worship. Service means as a worship, as an adoration of the divine in all beings uh, in order to help the poor, the sick, the illiterate, the suffering, the unhappy. There is so much to be done in the world. What does it matter if I have a, this little bit of pain or suffering? Sometimes elder people in the family, uh, um, women often, uh, they have absorbed a lot of suffering and overlooked it was, it was sort of society was like that. Nobody really cared. And, but the whole household responsibility was upon the woman. So to feed and take care of, to nurse um, sick children. And everything takes precedence over your own physical suffering. Because they depend on you. Now that thing, if we can expand it to the world around us. So that is the perspective of the karma yogi. Sadhan perspective. All right. Putting it together. If you contemplate upon the world as an appearance of pure consciousness. What is sorrow? Causality. Sorrow is uh, the threefold sorrow coming from outside. From natural causes, from other living beings and from one's own body mind. Deeper. Causality. It is the movement of the mind in the form of sorrow. Deeper still. You know, remember? It is the mind which can make a heaven of hell and a hell of heaven. It, uh, because of the lack of the restless mind, we have samsara. Not that my mind is restless because of samsara. The other way around. And also remember insight from positive psychology. The mind can hold on to only one thing at a time. And we have the freedom to choose what is the next thing that the mind is going to think about. And again and again and again. Then finally, the third level of causality of sorrow is owning the sorrow. I, this is my suffering. We do it instinctively. But if you are pure consciousness and this is an appearing in, in pure consciousness, why should it be yours? It's an appearance. Mm -hmm. Then the next is Vastu Drishti. What is sorrow itself? Yeah. Brahma Swarupa. The Vijnani sees that sorrow is nothing other than Brahman. It's pure consciousness alone which is sorrow. 
और ब्रह्म विवर्त इट्स लाइक अ ड्रीम लाइक अ मूवी और प्रकृति परिणाम इट्स रियल रियल बॉडी रियल वर्ल्ड रियल फिजिकल पेन बट आई एम अ विटनेस ऑफ दैट देर फॉर नॉट माइंड आई एम द विटनेस ऑफ दैट साधन दृष्टि फ्रॉम द परस्पेक्टिव ऑफ स्पिरिचुअल प्रैक्टिस दिस वेदांत विल से प्रज्ञा अपराध इट्स ऑफेंस अगेंस्ट वेदांत इट इवन कंप्लेन ग्रम्बल ऑलवेज से इफ यू आर इनलाइट यू वी लूज द राइट टू ग्रम्बल टू कंप्लेन सेकेंड इज डिवोटी इट इज द विल ऑफ गॉड my beloved alone in this has given sorrow and pleasure present pleasure and pain so it's all right or the yogi's perspective yogi can divert the attention from the world into the divinity within in this the atman within or from the karma yogi's perspective a great selflessness where one's own sorrows and problems are diminished it's often i have seen especially here in say modern new york in manhattan and uh, it's we we generate a narcissistic society because of not too many problems one might think oh, i have so many problems you don't know swami well you don't know if you go to <laughs> there are third world countries there are um, uh, people in terrible suffering right here also uh, our own sufferings are very little compared to that uh, and because of that we tend to dwell so much on i me mine and the antidote to, to that is a great selflessness that here is suffering humanity in front whatever we can at our own level just the people we are with the for next person we interact with let our feelings our prayers our uh, um, actions all be for the welfare of others not for me not for mine i am fine then he says purnendu shishirashaya like the full moon you will shine let us pray to sri ramakrishna ma sharada swami vivekananda uh, that may they bless us with this may the full moon of knowledge shine in our hearts and um, take us beyond sorrow forever om shanti 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 hi hari hi om tat sat श्रीरामकृष्णारूपणमस्तु